last week we kind of went off uh, off track. Um, you know, it was, it was post assassination attempt, and you know we really focused on God's kingdom and His offer of peace. Um, so this week, I'm kind of back on uh, what, what we were in. Um, and part of it is focusing on the church. I said we were going to have a couple, three sermons that were hot button issues, um, and, and this is one for me. But it, it's focusing on the the church in general, and a lot, there's just a lot of content out there to choose from, isn't there? That claims to be Christian. If you listen to Christian radio or if you listen to Christian podcasts and things like that, and um, I tend to to like to focus on what we're about rather than what we're against. But there's enough in Scripture that you can't avoid that either. You can't avoid some of the hard issues. And so the the title of the day is, What Do You Know? Um, And and it has to do with some of the things that you might want to avoid as a sort of Christian consumer, consumer of Christian things out there, even some of the things that you might want to speak against. And it, it could seem a little bit divisive, but I'll say this, I'm pointing more towards, I think, discernment and offering something corrective out there. And Scripture has a lot to say about bad people and bad ideas entering the church um, and and trying to lead God's people in a way that's different than what He desires. And and I'll go with this. There are certain spirits that were present during Jesus' time, certain groups that I think represent things that are are constant and consistent in the world around us and in God's people. Uh, Who did He have problems with? It was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians. You might not know the last group quite as well as the others. Uh, but I'm going to describe them, and, and maybe we'll get it where we find some of that out there today. But the Pharisees, they were the legalists, right? They were the ones who looked at God's law, the Hebrew law, the, the Torah, and they added their hedge around the law. They added additional rules and things that they asked people to do in order to be righteous, in order to be right with God. And it became very much a works type of theology. And then Jesus comes along and says, no, that's not it at all. These laws just represent my righteousness. They represent God's righteousness. You can't actually fulfill this, but they're intended to point you towards God. And and so they were part of the problem in that they were very much legalists. And it was my way or the highway, basically, for them. And then you had the Sadducees. And the Sadducees, uh, I, I remember my, uh, like, VBS, like I said, I didn't become a Christian until later, but I was exposed to church. And um, they always talked about the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. So they were very sad, you see. <laughs> that was the pun. Okay. Uh, but they didn't believe in a lot of the things that Jesus came and proclaimed. They, I would say that they were more secular. They were more about their power. Um, they often were the, the top officials in the Sanhedrin, that Jewish council that ruled Jerusalem. And then we had the Herodians. And you don't hear much about them. And there's a couple of different ideas about the Herodians. One was that they, they hitched their coattails to Herod, the political leader who claimed to be, to be Jewish. But there's also just this idea that they were very much worldly in their beliefs. And so those two things, hitching themselves to the world and leading from a world's perspective. And like I said, there's a lot of scripture now today too, um, so I'll try and keep my commentary limited or at least on point. Um, but there's more scripture in here than I could possibly even touch on these two things. So the first point is, is sort of right or left. And what it is, is it's defining our terms. It's like, what, what are these problems? And, uh, yeah, where are these problems and what are they? And I'll start out with a, a passage from Second Titus. It says, flee the evil desires of youth. And I'll just stop with that phrase. Flee the evil desires of youth. It's that first man that we were talking about in our call to worship. It's that natural state that we have. We're all born of the flesh initially. And we have evil desires. We have a desire to be right. We have a desire to to have things. We have desires, all kinds of desires. It says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish or stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, who has taken them captive to do his will. So I like that part about don't, be, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. 
There are several passages that are like that. One of my favorites says, don't be contentious about words. And it's a very specific translation. Uh, but there are people out there who want to argue a lot about words that aren't found in Scripture. They're words that I learned in seminary. But uh, there are words, nonetheless, that man has made up that you don't find in Scripture. And you find there are segments of legalists and Pharisees out there in this world. And I think all of them have podcasts, <laughs> just, just to be honest. Um, but there are some subsets of Christianity that are just deeply judgmental and, and dogmatic in what they believe. Um, they have an idea that somebody's theology must be perfect. Now, does anybody here think your theology is perfect? N neither do I, and I've got a lot of education. I'm pretty opinionated. I think I'm right, but I'm open to correction. And I think that's the way we all should be. Um, but there's this idea. Um, I was watching the DHF podcast on something we'll get to later. Um, and if you want to look on, on that topic, it's uh, numbers 31 and 35. But they talked about somebody who's healthy knows that some doctrines are essential. Some things that we believe are essential. And there are other things that we should debate and that we should talk with one another about. And that's where discipleship happens. And that's the healthy standpoint. There are others who think all doctrines are essential. And of course their interpretation is going to bear. And then there's some who think no doctrines are essential. And those are problems. We always want to live somewhere in between where God can teach us, where we can teach one another, where iron sharpens iron. But I'd say this, that's the, the Pharisees. And if you add a little bit of the Herodian to that, the person who is formed by the world's way of doing things, somebody who's uprooted from a community where you do have iron sharpening iron and when you do blunt the rough edges of one another, you can get people who are zealots um, and, and they act much like the world. Like I said, I think of these young bucks maybe judging and sowing dissent on podcasts. Uh, it seems like everyone has a forum today and we'll get back to that. But there's a passage where Jesus is being watched by people looking for a fault when he was in fact trying to offer healing. And this comes from Mark chapter 3. It says, he looked around them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. And then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Rodians how they might kill Jesus. So like I said, that's why I'm pointing at these as, um, as examples of that spirit in the church. I'll give an example too. How many of you are aware of the controversy surrounding Alistair Begg a while back? Probably not many. I've, yeah, I've mentioned it in our Bible study. And Alistair Begg, I've been a fan of him for, for many years. Um, he is, is dead on doctrinally. And what happened is in a podcast, he was talking about a grandmother who came and was distressed over her grandson who was going to um, be unified, however you want to say it, get married to another man. And she was asking how to deal with it. And if you know Alistair Begg, he's just like I was two weeks ago. He's pretty blunt on the topic. He is biblical, straight down the line. But giving advice to this woman, he said, and there's context that we don't have. He said, you know, I think you might want to go. And you might want to consider taking a present. And people jumped all over that. Young podcasters jumped all over that. Like he was somehow advocating for that. When he made very clear earlier on, he said, no. Does, does he, does this grandson understand your stance on it? Does he understand the biblical stance that you put forward? The flip side of that is, does he understand you love him? I heard that with a pastoral heart. I heard that as him saying, you have made clear what God says on this topic, and you are going to now show this young man love. And that could be redemptive in the future. That's what I'm hearing out of that. But you have people that are uprooted outside of the community, jumped all over it, proclaimed him as falling into error, a heretic, people calling him on the phone, demanding things from him. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. A judgmentalism out there that is uprooted from a community that is trying to do redemptive things in this world. So I'm going to limit our criticism there because I actually see a lot of potential in, in some of these people. Uh, many of them are seeking and mostly proclaim the truth. What they lack is the spirit necessary and the relationship necessary to reach the hurting in the moment. Um, you know, maybe the head knowledge hasn't quite made it to heart knowledge. So the flip side, I would say what we would call liberal is more the Sadducees. And that would go with the no doctrine is essential. I, I first ran into this and really understood it when I was in seminary. I was assigned a, a sort of a novel to read. 
And uh, it was called Shadow of the Galilean. It was by a man named Gerd Thiessen. And so the idea was it was somebody who was following along and traveling, and he was you know, seemingly just behind, days or weeks just behind the things that, the events that happened in Jesus' life. And as I'm reading, there's something really subtle in here. And I realized that all the miraculous stuff, like even the sky being darkened at his crucifixion, the guy was internalizing it and making it like a representation of his internal and emotional state. And I'm like, this does not seem right. I think he's proclaiming that these miracles didn't happen. So I go and look him up. And he's part of something called the Jesus Seminar, which sounds pretty holy, doesn't it? They were active in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And what they did was they engaged in critical theory. They were, that's a hymnal, not a Bible. They, they would go into the Bible and they would, um, you, you know, look at texts in the old language. And then they would talk about the sayings of Jesus and the miracles of Jesus, and they would vote on whether they thought it actually happened or not. They, 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 usually, they actually used beans to, to say yay or nay. And they usually decided that it didn't happen. If, if it was something that we'd considered dead on theologically, they'd say, oh, well, that was, that was you know, uh, some author later on changed those words. Or they would claim that the miracle didn't happen, but this was just somebody's emotional state. That's the roots of liberalism, liberal church culture. And then you'll find a lot of social activism out there. I, I was part of a class where we traveled to a lot of the historic sites in, uh, uh, in our movement, the Restoration Movement. And, and if you want to know, we're very much devoted to Scripture and devoted towards one another in discipleship. That's always what we've been about. But um, we started talking about how each of us became Christians. And he said he started out going to what would be considered fairly liberal, uh, an offshoot of the Universalist churches. And he showed up one day, and the message was about saving historic barns. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I heard that. Um, what happens is when nothing is essential, you have nothing to speak on, and social activism becomes the thing. So, and then I was going to talk about the JDP theory, like how, how the, this Jesus seminar did their work, but we'll skip over that. But you get people for whom nothing is essential, and you add the Herodian mindset. It's more, let's go with a Machiavell Machiavellian. If you ever read Machiavelli, right, he was uh, about achieving political ends through whatever means necessary. We start to run into what we call progressivism in the church or progressive Christianity. Um, like I said, there are, there are two good podcasts out there on this and, and one of them actually disagrees with me on something and I'm okay with that because we can disagree. Um, but it's 30, 34 and 35. Um, but 1 Corinthians 15 starting in verse 44 says this, and this is from our uh, call to worship. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second, the man, second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. As is the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. And what you find in these groups is they still take that foolishness of youth. They still take that earthly man and they elevate it. Um, and, and then you add an agenda to affirm everything that you want to believe and you have a recipe for deception. So I, I've made the point before. Jesus was upset with, not the deceived, he was upset with the deceivers, right? He was upset with people that put them forward as leaders and put forward deceptions and misled the people. But the people who were misled, he tended to be very kind to. He, he, wasn't, uh, he, he didn't say everything was okay. He didn't tell the woman at the well, go and do what you've been doing. He said, go and sin no more. But he gave her, um, he gave her forgiveness. He offered that to her. And so you have progressive leaders, maybe liberal followers, if you want to use those terms separately. And then we slowly are seeing a blending of the two. So how do we judge these things? Well, I think hot or cold kind of gets down to a little bit of it. Um, on the hot side, we do see the Pharisees and, and the Zealots, and they really wanted to be righteous. They really did. And what we find in Scripture is many of them were converted. You know, the arrogance of youth is often blunted by experience. That's something I've seen over and over again. So that's why I, I didn't want to dwell on that part. 
But left unchecked, that sort of legalism becomes sort of an, a, a cold orthodoxy that is lacking in mercy. And I think our corrective, we're going to go back to when we talked about um, all the, the other mindsets out there about what's okay and what love is. And we'll look at 1 Corinthians 13, just verses 1 through 3. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. There's your metric right there. Each of us is incomplete in our knowledge. We should be loving with one another as we struggle with our understanding of God. And if we're not, there's no room for discipleship. If you insist everyone be perfect. I look back at becoming a Christian when I was 26, and I can think of some things I said in the first couple years where I was a Christian. Thank goodness there were some people who were patient with me <laughs> because I said some things that were wrong, and I was convinced I was right. We should be those kind of peacemakers in the world, gently correcting. That's what's asked of us. And when we see that kind of harshness out there, unless it's on things that are just a blight on the name of Christ, we should stand up against that. We should allow people to be disciples. We should allow them to learn and develop their relationship with God. On the flip side, I think we have the cold part, which would be that, that liberalism leading to progressivism. And I would go so far as to say it's not Christian. And that's the problem here. That's why I'm, I'm a bit harder on this one. It's a different God that they worship. And it's very deceptive. When you look at the values that come out of those churches, they're very me-centric. They're, they're humanistic. They're about the feels. They're about affirming whatever makes you feel good. They're about feeding the first man that we were talking about. They're about feeding the natural man. All the things, and when I say man, I mean humankind. Man, woman. All the things that come from within us that God seeks to correct. They're feeding the dust. They sow doubt about the truth and they feed the desires of the flesh, flesh just like the serpent did in the garden. Second Timothy uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 1, says this, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, having nothing to have nothing to do with such people. So this is Paul speaking to Timothy. And we like to look at this passage and think it's talking about the world around us. But it's Paul speaking to Timothy about the kind of people who will try to make their way into the church. It says, having a form of, of godliness. I think I may have put it up there. It's, it's this idea that they have a piety or a false reverence about them. And yet, they are this other kind of people. They're like the world in their leadership and in their values. So, you know, having... Um, having a form of godliness, there's this element that you will find in some of these churches where they steal the trappings of authority. You'll very much find that in a church, quote, church, church just means assembly, assembly together. So maybe they are. They're a church of some sort. Uh, they're fond of their vestments. They're very fond of, of formal things that we think of as churchy because it gives them their authority because they have none in themselves. They're fond of their ordinations. They're fond of their ceremonies proclaiming people leaders. There's a local church that ordained a transvestite as one of their leaders. And this happened a year and a half ago. And, and there are some warning signs. There was a time where I was a liaison to churches in my capacity as a, a chaplain, um, just trying to build up um, resources for our soldiers in various communities. And you could walk into certain churches and you'll find that the leadership will be weighted very much in a DEI kind of way. Um, I walked into many churches where every, every significant leader was a woman. The, the men were a little bit off. And I don't have anything against women leadership. It's just that there are things that are out there where you know there's an agenda at work. That passage in 2 Timothy goes on and says, They are the kind who worm their way into the homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able 
to come to knowledge of the truth. But as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers opposed the truth. They are men of depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned are rejected. The focus for me there is that they are always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Always learning. There's a guise of scholarship over much of what they do. That JDP theory that I was talking about. People like Gerd Thierson in the Jesus Seminar. And that's even self-proclaimed on their progressive websites. There's a website out there that has five key things that make somebody progressive. And if you read them, you will realize those five things are not Christian. Not at all. Um, so everything is permissible. They put this guise of, of, uh, uh, of intellectual authority over it. And then they put the trappings of the church over top of it, and they preach something that is completely contrary to the gospel and completely contrary to Christ. It's like a Wild West saloon when you compare it to the true nature of the true church. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says this, Enter through the narrow gate, for the wide gate, <coughs> excuse me, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. You will find that in the progressive movement, everything is allowed. You will find that Jesus isn't the authority. And you might not recognize it, because they'll talk about Jesus and they'll quote Jesus. But they'll claim the words that they don't like of his were corrupted. And they'll do it so that they can pick and choose. They'll claim that his servants don't have authority. Certainly, if I were to step into one of those churches, I would have no authority. <laughs> Preaching straight from Scripture. They'll say that Paul isn't an authority. They'll claim he was just a man. They'll deny inspiration. They'll claim that we know more. 2,000 years later, we, we know more. They'll claim that the Bible isn't the authority. It was just written by man. They'll put it up next to other holy books like the Quran. They'll say it was written by men, that it was corrupted over time. And they'll just use it for their own purposes. I, I did find something, again, from those DHF podcasts. And uh, one of them was an interesting statement. It's, for those of us who are Christian, we would say that we would use the Bible to interpret love. And for them, they would say that we would use love to interpret the Bible. And the question you have to ask is, what do you mean by love? And what they tend to mean is the feels. Whatever they feel is right, then they'll use it to interpret Scripture. But for us, we will look at Scripture and go, is my love up to the standard? And we'll be challenged by it. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. And then it's followed by... Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. So that passage talks about people coming in sheep's clothing. And I'll tell you what the sheep's clothing looked like. It looks like another dictionary. We can talk about words like, you know, we talk about people who become contentious over words, right? But we talk about things like salvation. We talk about things like redemption. We talk about things like repentance. And they will use those very same words and they will change what they mean. Salvation is it's a journey of self-discovery. Repentance is just turning towards and doing what makes you feel good. The, the words are the same. The meaning is 100% different. The gospel has changed. And the God they serve is not our God. They serve another gospel. They'll say that there are many paths to God. So they have a false allegiance when they claim the name of Christ. Jude uh, verses 3 and 4 says, Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. So this is nothing new. This is Jude penning this, very early on in church history. This is nothing new. But there are people that are part of a broader culture. And they still seek to fill that hole that we each have in our hearts. We have a need for God to worship. We have a need for a God to worship. We have a need to worship the one and only true God. But there's intentional misdirection happening. 
at a leadership level. And like I said, it's the deceptive people that God judges, not those who are deceived. They serve a different, different God. Um, you may know that we as a church separated from the disciples of Christ. And we were like a lot of churches. We hearkened back. That was a title for a movement that started in the 1830s. And, and it was a good movement when it started. And we didn't know where the DOC was headed. But there's a, a story, and it is 100% true, where at a general assembly, there was a prayer offered up to some sort of earth mother pagan god. It was Sephora. I cannot remember the name of it. and didn't choose to look it up. But it was a disgusting moment. I know people who witnessed it. And there's a reason that we left. You will find that they are committed to there being many paths. And they don't place judgment on anything. Revelation 3.9 is Jesus speaking to the church at Philadelphia. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those, <clears throat> those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews but are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come to you and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you because you have kept my word. So Jesus himself has something to say about this sort of thing. The disobedient and the destructive who have falsely claimed God's name and authority. He calls them a synagogue of Satan. I think that's a striking phrase. It's something we should take seriously. God will not look the other way for the unrepentant who have put a blight on Jesus' name. There is judgment. There's also a promise for those who persevere in the truth. So let's get at what this is. right? We've talked about two very different people. That Pharisaic mindset, the Sadducees. There's an underlying sin for both of them, I think. And it's something I call the Messiah complex. Um, there was uh, an episode of The Simpsons one time, and it is pretty irreverent. I can't necessarily uh, 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 recommend it, but Homer Simpson goes to Jerusalem. Sometimes they call it the Jerusalem complex. And it's people who go to the Holy Land and all of a sudden feel like God's calling them to be a prophet. And, and that's what happens with, with Homer. And of course, in, in the end, he's, he's spouting heresy. But... Um, it's this idea that people get into it and they think that they're the story all of a sudden. They think that they're the middle of it all. Thinking that your understanding is the way. I may be called to preach and teach, but my understanding isn't the way. There will be many preachers and teachers after me. There have been many preachers and teachers before me. You may be called to be an elder. You may be called to be a steward of God's work in some way, but there will always be others. Um, in Jesus' words from Matthew 12, he says, and so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings out evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word that has been spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, or by your words you will be condemned. I used to read that last passage and think, oh my goodness, if I misspoke about God, I was going to be condemned. And that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about people who are bringing that, those falsehoods forward and doing it consistently, and, and they will be condemned. Have you ever wondered about what it means to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? I, I certainly did. You know, that's considered the unforgivable sin. It's the only one. You know, we may have heard that there are like, what, seven cardinal sins? There's only one that's considered unforgivable in Scripture. And when you look at and translate that, you will find that it actually kind of means to slander the Holy Spirit. It means to intentionally misrepresent what God is doing through His Holy Spirit in the world. And I'll say this, if you want to parse it out, people might have a Messiah complex, think their theology is the greatest and that should be the thing, or they might think that their own feels and way they want things to be is the own thing. The legalists aren't blasphemers in that sense. They may be passionate, um, they may misattribute things and they may get it wrong, but God often humbles the proud. So I think there's a lot of hope for people out of that community. I'll give an example. As a, as a slightly older chaplain, I find new chaplains coming in are fresh off of their seminary. And they're often very young and they often don't have very much time in the church and they haven't been humbled. And they think they have all the answers. 
and you kind of have to shake your head and then you come to them a few years later and they've matured and they're great men of God, men and women of God doing great things for our soldiers. But the progressive side, there's this intentional misdirection. They know the words. They've studied the book. They know the facts. They've studied the archaeology. They know the gospel and yet they present something different and they cast God in their own image. We are not and never will be the point of the story. As people, it is always God. So what's the answer? You know, you know something heavy like that. Um, that's about as close to fire and brimstone as I get. And honestly, I'm preaching to the choir here. I just want you to know the lay of the land and what's going on around us. We'll go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I love this passage. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I'll go with the middle of that. Love does not delight with evil, but rejoices in the truth. But love wraps all this up. So I would say we should pray for those who are deceived, those who have fallen into these deceptions. I would say we should pray for the arrogant, that they will be humbled. I should say don't rely on your own understanding. I would say ask God to do battle against the hearts and schemes of the proud. The question isn't what you know. I think if we're stuck on that, you know, we might think that there's a litmus test. You have to have a certain IQ or a certain education level or a certain... God calls everybody. The question is, who do you know? If you know Jesus, you know that you don't have to get it all right. If you know Jesus, you know you won't and can't get it all right. If you know Jesus, you know that He is always working. If you know Jesus, you know He is faithful to complete His mission. Don't ever think it relies solely on you and you getting it right and saying it all right. If you know Jesus, He knows He will use flawed you. And if you know Jesus, you know that He will use the flawed person next to you. So who do you know? I pray it's Jesus. He died for the forgiveness of your sins. He sits on His throne and is at the right hand of the Father. He will protect His legacy. And we need to know that there are others out there who are proclaiming a different Jesus. We really need to proclaim ours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you.